Hey folks! Okay, well, to get into our discussion of programming, uh, the first thing we want to start off with is talking about programming languages themselves. So what is a programming language? How is it different from uh, regular natural language? Uh, what are the rules for programming languages? What are their meanings? So these are the kinds of things that I want to get into today. And uh, then we can get into actually trying to work with one. So I want to talk a little bit about programming languages themselves. Um, I want to talk about the, the plethora of programming languages that exist these days. I want to talk a little bit about the rules for languages and the idea of syntax, the grammar rules versus semantics, their meanings. And I want to talk about the relationship between the sort of high level programming languages that we're generally going to be working with and what's happening at the machine level, at the hardware level, to turn what we've written into an application that actually does something for us when we try and run it. And then take a look at the tools that are involved in bridging that gap between the programming languages that we're writing in sort of a human-friendly fashion, more or less, and the, uh, and the ability to have something that actually executes and runs. So that's the plan for this session. So we'll start off with talking about programming languages and natural languages. So, you know, it, there are a ton of natural languages that we're all used to uh, learning and using. Well, for some of us, we're really only kind of fluent in one, but uh, but many of you are fluent in, in multiple natural languages. And you know that a natural language is meant to give you kind of a rich set of capabilities for describing all sorts of possible different things and to giving all kinds of different nuances and anything you want to describe, you can come up with all sorts of different ways to do it. And you also know that because they are so rich and so flexible, natural languages also tend to have a lot of room for interpretation. You know, if I say something to you, it's entirely possible you're going to take that in multiple possible different ways, um, depending on sort of your experiences and my experiences and what our background is and what kind of a mood we're in. And so natural languages are very rich, very flexible, but have some ambiguity in them, have the ability to take things in different ways. And so when it comes to programming, when it comes time to write something that's essentially a set of instructions telling a computer what we want done, we want something that's precise and something that's unambiguous, something where there's no possible room for misinterpretation about how this is supposed to behave. And so programming languages usually have a much more specific purpose. They're much more focused, they're much narrower, and they're more restrictive in terms of what they can allow you to express. So programming languages are meant to allow you to express the kinds of instructions you need to provide for the, the system that you're working on, but again, within this kind of rigid set of rules and this limited vocabulary. So they tend to be much smaller than natural languages, and they have much simpler grammars than natural languages. Um, sometimes it doesn't seem like they're simpler, but that's usually because they're new to us and we're trying to pick them up and we just don't know. We, we haven't spent as much time with a programming language as we have with whatever language we're speaking normally. So we do want to go through and talk about sort of the limitations and the differences between a programming language and a natural language. So there are a ton of different programming languages out there. If, you, uh, if you're ever feeling curious, if you go to Rosetta Code, they have a collection of different tasks and a collection of different programming languages. And you can look at how these different tasks are done in different languages. So if we uh, just pop over there for a second, uh, at the moment, how many languages have they got on here right now? So currently they've got 838 programming languages listed here, right? And examples listed in each of these different languages. And again, there are a ton of different languages. Many of these are designed for very specific purposes or specific systems or specific user groups, but there are just a ton of these things out here. Now, if you're going to make a career in this business, then 
there are probably going to be at any given point in time, you know, three, five, six or seven languages that you're working with on a kind of regular basis. And there might be another half dozen or so that you're familiar with or that you've used in the past, but you don't use a whole lot currently. And so you're, you're going to be picking up new languages as time goes on, and you're going to be forgetting about languages that you don't use anymore. But, um, but ordinarily, there's a relatively small set of these things that you specifically are working with at any given point in time. But there are a lot of them out there, and you've got to be pretty much prepared to pick up new languages as time goes on. So, again, some of these languages are designed to be general purpose, where you can do more or less anything in them. Um, they're not tailored to any one specific area. And others are meant for very specific things. You know, some are meant for um, network coding, some are meant for web development, some are meant for system administration and task automation. And they've all got different purposes and different goals. And the language itself is written differently to try and accommodate those different goals or those different user groups. So each language is going to have a very specific set, a very specific vocabulary, right? The, the words that are in use in the language, it's going to have its own alphabet, right? What specific characters are used in that language. And it's going to have its own set of grammar rules. And we'll refer to that as the syntax of the language, the grammar rules. And then the semantics are, you know, if you've got a, a particular program you've written and assuming that it's following the grammar rules correctly, its syntax is correct, then that program does something. The semantics are the description, if you like, of what that program means, what its purpose is, what it accomplishes, what it does. So semantics is the meaning, the syntax is the grammar rules for the language. Now, there are a ton of different layers of programming language. At the very bottom level, the hardware that you're working with essentially interprets a bunch of binary signals. It's looking at a bunch of different signals that are, you know, voltage high, voltage low, on, off, true, false, high, low, whatever, you, however you want to think about this. It's this collection of different binary signals and the hardware, the, the circuitry, the chips are designed to interpret patterns of these high lows, on off, zero ones, and decide what the pattern means and send appropriate signals off to the rest of the circuitry to accomplish whatever it is you want. So at the machine level, the programs that we're running, the applications that we're running are the, just these sequences of zeros and ones. Not terribly easy for humans to read or to modify. Uh, let me see if I can pick up one here. So this is a uh, the first uh, you know 15 or 20 lines of one program looking at it, looking at the application and seeing the sequence of zeros and ones here. Now this particular program is something like 1400 lines long and so it's just this long sequence of zeros and ones. So you can imagine that, you know, trying to write a program like this as a human, and all this program actually does. Here, let me show you what this, uh, oops, I don't know what I modified there, but all this program does is, oops, how about I actually type the name of the program, right? All this program does is print hello and goodbye. So that 1400 lines of zeros and ones just prints those two simple lines of text. Should probably set it up so that you can actually see those. Yeah. All right, my YouTube is rusty here. Let's run it again and show you there. All it does is print hello and goodbye. So this great ugly collection of zeros and ones is necessary just to do that. Obviously, we don't want to be trying as a human being to edit files consisting of 1400 lines of zeros and ones to do this. So 
way back in the 50s, they got the idea that, you know, perhaps what we could do instead is to have another program that reads stuff that we write and translates it into those zeros and ones. And so we write something simpler, something a little more human friendly, and it translates it into the zeros and ones. So this idea of an assembly language is that we take each pattern and give it a name. So there might be some sequence of zeros and ones that represents moving a value from some storage register into uh, some place in memory. Or uh, there might be some pattern that represents adding two things together, or some pattern that represents subtracting one thing from another. So the idea was you come up with a, a simple language where we give a name, like let's say move, to, uh, to the pattern. And then the different arguments that go along with that, you know, if you want to move something from a storage register, or want to move a value into some storage register, then we come up with some sort of a syntax that says, okay, well, we'll have a pattern that represents the, the, which register we want, and we'll have a pattern that represents the number that we want to move. And we give these slightly more human-friendly names to the different patterns. And so now as a person, when I want to work on something, when I want to write a program, I write these, I write the instructions in this format, assembly language, and then I run some tool that take, that reads those instructions I've written and translates them into the patterns of zeros and ones. So this was the first big leap forward. We were saying, okay, it's much easier for me to write something like move R8, you know, hash six, than it is for me to write whatever sequence of zeros and ones actually represents that. It's so easy to make a mistake when you're writing these sequences of zeros and ones. Um, and it's so difficult to read these things and, um, and understand what they mean. And you actually do get better at it as time goes on, but it's really not fun. So this idea of an assembly language and having an assembler, this tool that does the translation for us, was the first big leap forward. Now, this is pretty good. This is much better, but it still takes, you know, again, maybe for the same program, it might still take those 1,400 lines of, uh, of these assembly language instructions to accomplish something fairly small. So it's better but it would be nicer if we had something that was still more human friendly. Where if I could write something like print hello, you know, print uh, and goodbye, that would be way nicer for, for me as a, from a human point of view to, uh, to work with. And so this next idea was to have a high level language, a programming language that was much closer to a natural language, much, much more human friendly and then have yet another software tool that would read languages written in this, or read programs written in this high level language and translate it into the binary for us. And so this concept of high level languages, human friendly languages came about and the notion of a compiler, a translation tool that reads something written in a high level language and translates it for us into this sequence of zeros and ones. So this is where we're focused for, um, for the moment in our, in our programming course. We will be writing things in a high level language, C++, and then we'll be using another software tool, a compiler, to translate that into executable programs. And if you ever want to look at the, the binary it produces, you can, or you can have it translate these, translate your high level code into assembly language, and you can take a look at that and see what it looks like. But again, we're going to be writing things in the high-level language, running a compiler to translate it, and then executing the result. So I'll just give you a kind of a quick look at what that might actually look like. So let's... Uh, don't worry about the editor that I'm using here, and, and don't worry too much about the code that I show you. I'm just going to give you a kind of a quick look at uh, the stuff, what did I call that program? So the program in question here was this some program.cpp and the .cpp just indicates that it's a C++ program. 
So this is the C++ code for that program that printed hello and goodbye. So again, it's relatively human friendly, comparatively speaking, compared to the uh, the assembly language, 1400 lines of assembly language, or the, uh, the, the 1400 lines of binary, this is much better. Um, we'll talk about what all these different pieces mean in a little bit, but again, we're telling it to include some programming library, we've got a main routine that controls what's going to happen, and then we've got a couple of print statements, a print statement that says print hello, and another print statement that says print the and goodbye. So this is getting much closer to something that we as a human can manage to work with. So this would be our source code, our high-level language code. And then the process to take that high-level code and from it produce an executable is that we run a compiler. So again, don't get too fussed on this for now, but our compiler is called G++. We're going to have the G++ compiler read that high-level program we produced. And as output, I'm going to ask it to create this executable some program X. And let me just tweak that a little so you can see what's going on here. So from that high-level language program, we're going to ask it to produce an executable. So the compiler will yell at me if there's a mistake in the code. If it doesn't yell at me, then it actually completed the translation OK. So this has gone through, read that high-level language code, and it stored the result in this file named SumProgramX. So that's the one that's got all that binary in it, all the zeros and ones. So now we can try and, again, run that particular program. Where are we here? And it does our hello and goodbye. So that's the kind of cycle that we're looking at. We edit our high-level code. That's what we work with as a human. We use this compiling tool to go through and read our source code and produce our executable and then we run the executable. And that's the cycle that we're going to be looking at over and over and over again this semester. And it's really just a matter of developing our design skills and problem solving skills. So when somebody says, I want a program that can do blah, we can figure out how to do it. Developing our fluency with the C++ programming language so that we can actually make that happen in code. And then using the compiler to create the executable from whatever we've gone through and, and, uh, and designed. All right, that's the plan for now. We will come back and start looking at some C++ in detail next time around.